Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to yet another Sales Hacker webinar. And today we have uh, a topic that um, I would say the folks in the sales community are very, very passionate about heated, heated discussions happening on LinkedIn and all over the place. And uh, I'm just thrilled to have two of the smartest minds in uh, sales development joining us today to help us uh, put this at rest. So um, this is a huge webinar. We have over uh, 1,300 uh, registrations for today and uh, without further ado we're going to discuss the evolution of the SDR and why the SDR is no longer an entry level role so uh, let's dive right into it cool yeah super excited so what we're going to talk about today is the evolution of the SDR why the SDR is no longer an entry level role and we're going to hop into introductions right here we're going to go right into it so as you guys see it's hosted by me, I got John Barrows, got my uh, CEO on here as well. We also got Gatano here as well. So we're super excited to dive into this and really talk about the framework and the mindset of where we where we see the SDR role going and how you can get ahead of the trend and not get caught up by it. So this is the agenda for the day: uh, the current state of an SDR, the long-term vision of an SDR, tools of an SDR, and how to stand out from the and standing out from the noise. I feel like these four things are going to be what we're diving into. I don't know if, John, you want to ask more context on kind of what you see with this agenda moving forward? Yeah, no, I think it's just going to be an open conversation here about uh, what we're seeing. Um, you know, we'll go through these intros here, but, you know, I think there's there's a lot, there's a big shift going on right now um, with the SDR, the entire role, and I think the entire industry. And uh, I'm going to try to put this in context, too, with what we're mainly talking about, which is kind of that predictable revenue model, if you will, with the SDR, BDR, AE thing. Um, and I'm guessing most of the thousand people who are on this are um, are really kind of in that tech SaaS world. Um, so just to have some context, you know, there's other there's there are other worlds uh, where the SDR role hasn't even really shown at all. You know, hasn't even penetrated yet. Um, but so that's why I think it's cool to stay on top of things and where things are going with this this industry because it's just the long tail of this hits everybody else as well. So looking forward to it. Yeah, definitely. And, in, and from my background of being an SDR. Being an SDR manager, currently working with John and still working with sales development teams, this is an exciting topic because I see a lot of people on LinkedIn talking about, hey, this is where I think that the sales development role is going. I think it's going to be out in a year. I think AI and robots are going to take over. So we want to stake all these claims I've been commenting and engaging with people with to see, hey, look, this is actually where we believe things are going and this is where we feel the industry is going as well. So we're going to hop in introductions. Uh, John's going to start us off. Yeah, I don't want to go too much detail. I mean, for those who don't know me, I've been doing training now for about about eight years or so. But started a company, sold it off to Staples, took some training called Basho, loved it. Um, joined that company, and then long story short, they screwed it up, and I took it all over. And um, you know, those are some of the logos that I'm working with these days: Salesforce, LinkedIn, Google, a lot of the SaaS companies. I'm mostly out in San Francisco, even though I'm based in Boston. Most of my time is spent out in San Francisco, and it's mostly working with. Um, uh, you know, the, the BDR, SDR community, right? Because we do two things. We do filling the funnel and driving a close. And filling the funnel is all about that outbound stuff. And I'd say 75 to 80% of the revenues that we generate and what we do is based off of that. So having some fun and, and trying to trying to stay on top of things. But the last thing I'll say is, you know, from a, from a sales trainer standpoint, I don't really consider myself a sales trainer. Uh, I consider myself a sales rep that happens to train. Uh, I think there's a big difference there. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so if you guys aren't familiar with me, my name is Morgan J. Ingram. Previously was an SDR, SDR manager at Terminus. I'm now the director of sales execution evolution I'm at J. Barrow Sales Training. And majority of how people know me is through the SDR Chronicles and also start the SDR Roundtable. It's uh, one of the reasons that John hired me. He saw me through the SDR Chronicles. And you know, my main focus is to continuously enhance sales development as a profession, help be the, help be the voice of SDRs that are out there in the grind and the trenches, like when I first started my series, that's what I was doing, and really talk about where I believe the sales development role is going and how I see even older companies starting to transition into this sales development model, the predictable revenue model, and putting it in a spot spotlight where people are actually are coming in, they're seeing results, they have to be consistent, and they have to have a mindset, which is what we'll talk about more today is where I believe that the SDR role, there's so many things that go into it which I, that's why I don't believe it's an entry-level role anymore. It can't be considered right. because of all the things that you have to do. There's so much noise. There are so many technologies out there. There's so many emails and 
phone calls that are being sent out, how do you rise above the noise and how do you have to increase that business acumen to put yourself in a spotlight that most people coming out of college or two, three years out of college, it's very hard for you to be able to do that. So we're going to dive more into that today, but that's my background. I'm super excited to be here. <clears throat> Awesome. Thanks, Morgan. I'll keep this short and sweet. I run all digital marketing at Sales Hacker. I used to uh, run all of SEO and content marketing at Pipedrive, a very well-known CRM software company. And, uh, you know, someone that has been largely dedicating uh, my career to uh, the inbound side and SEO, it's always fascinating for me to kind of see where the intersection is of SEO and inbound marketing with outbound and uh, sales development. So I'm, I'm really excited to just uh, learn from these two superstars here as these guys are, are really the stars of the show and I'm just here to kind of uh, lend some support. But um, without further ado, let's dive into a question. Um, <clears throat> and speaking of questions, guys, uh, there's uh, a lot of attendees on this webinar and I'm sure you're going to have questions throughout. Feel free to just go ahead and drop them in and um, we'll, we'll try to cherry pick a few that are good throughout the uh, webinar as we see uh, an opportunity to present them. And then at the end, there's going to be a lot of time for Q&A. So uh, don't be shy about your questions. Feel free to unload them on us as you, as you uh, feel uh, is necessary. Um, and with that said, let's, let's start with one question that came from LinkedIn today. Um, so uh, does age matter? for an SDR. So we all know that the SDRs tend to be on the younger side. There tends to be this bias toward younger candidates as the stereotype of an SDR, someone with high energy who's ready to kind of get beat down during that learning process, uh, meaning long hours, potentially even low pay, a lot of rejection. Uh, it's a tough sort of um, uh, framework for somebody stepping into a role. And uh, the, the question really was, does age matter in the context of, let's say someone's looking to transition into tech sales, for example, but they're in that mid-career stage. Um, does that have sort of a negative connotation on it, or it, does it not really matter at all? And uh, I guess I'll pass this over to you, Morgan, uh, to take a stab at first. But uh, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a great question. And from my standpoint, I was a manager. I managed someone who was 30. I managed someone who was 31. And they had different backgrounds. Oh, wait, how old are you, Morgan? 25. All right. I'm just making sure everybody knows. <laughs> I'm old, man. I'm old, Damn, man. I didn't even know that. Damn. Uh, 25. So yeah. um, managing a 30-year-old, managing a 31-year-old, and through that process, they did, they did not feel as if they were being put against a wall and they were an outcast. They were an integral part of our culture, actually. When they were a 30-year-old who I'm still really good friends with, was the main centerpiece as part of our culture. And so one of the main things that I saw from both of those individuals is that they were willing to take a step down for the most part, from, you know, they were doing really well in their industry, take that step down to accelerate their career to the next level. And I feel like if the leader understands that and they accept that person, then yes, they'll feel comfortable. I think the problem is a flip question is, the leader, is the leader comfortable bringing that person in and why aren't they? I feel like you need to look at what your intangibles are and what you're looking to do at the end of the day. Because if someone has intrinsic drive and they have a chip on their shoulder, I'm bringing that person in, I'm going to teach them the skill sets to be successful, and I'm going to put them in a spotlight so they can see the results at the end of the day and go into that account executive role. So I don't just, if anyone is 30, 31, 32, 34, 35, Consider taking that role into that company as an SCR, knowing that, hey, I'm going to bite the bullet for a year, and then a year later, I'm going to be really excited because I found an industry that I enjoy and I can thrive in and see success and really just thrive with that culture. I, I, age is just a number from my belief as, as I've been throughout my career so far. As long as you your team has the same mindset, the same culture, the same energy, you're going to thrive and you'll see success. So that's my answer to that question. Yeah, and I just to chime in on that, I agree wholeheartedly as, as far as, you know, if age did matter, not, it, I, I put myself as a hiring manager here, and if I was younger, you know, 20, I'm 42, just to throw it out there, uh, but if I, was, if I was 25, 26, 27 as an SDR manager, and I had a 30, 35-year-old come in, and I judge them based on their age, then if I was that 35-year-old, I wouldn't want to work for that company anyways, right? Um, I do want to kind of chime in a little bit on where this conversation is going with the evolution of the role, <clears throat> because I think we, it's, it's important to segment out the SDR role and understand, look, there's the inbound SDR role and then the outbound SDR role. And this will get into kind of what we're talking about here, but I genuinely, I think the, actually the inbound SDR role the ones where, you know, you, the, the marketing, SEO, all that stuff drives that lead. I actually think that's going to 
elevate way senior and it's going to be more customer success and what i'm seeing out there is that is a lot of like senior sales reps who have been there done that they've been out in the field for years and they're like they're just sick of just travel like look i'm sick of one of the reasons i hired morgan for for instance is so that i can get off a damn airplane you know what i mean like i was i did 90 days of training last year 130 40 days on the road you know, and there's only so many more years I can do that. And so what I'm seeing is I'm actually seeing um, field sales reps come back inside and say, hey, you know, I'm going to be more like customer success here where I'm going to take that inbound lead and I, I know the product, I know how to run this, and I'll maybe take a little bit less commission but a higher base salary so I can sit in the office from 8 o'clock in the morning till 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon and go home and be with my family. So I actually see that as a major trend going on. Um, you're seeing, I'm seeing it right now with those appointment setting companies, a whole bunch of like the appointment ones that are actually make cold calls or whatever. Uh, a lot of I, senior reps I know are actually going to those companies to say, Hey, can I just sit behind a phone here from nine to five and make some calls here and get paid, you know, probably three quarters of what I got paid. Um, now the outbound SDR role, that's the one where the questions I think lie of what is going to happen to that role as far as an entry level position. But to the point of age, if you got the right attitude, um, I, I would actually be impressed with a 30, 35 year old coming to me saying, look, I, I know I want to get into the tech field. I know I got to start at the bottom and you should start at the bottom anyways, because you can't really understand the product or, you know, if you haven't gone through all those roles, how can you possibly ultimately represent that product the way that you should be representing it? And if you have any aspirations of becoming a, you know, a leader within the organizations, my opinion is if you don't start at the bottom, then, then how can you get perspective on how to manage a team like that or a, a company like that if you're not putting in the grunt work first and and to that point you know john you reminded me so much of my days at pipe drive where we built this massive sort of inbound content engine that was fueled mm -hmm. by seo but um you know that consultative sort of inside sales uh role was so prevalent because the way that the pipe drive basically sdr function was broken out was no outbound at all really the inbound was so rapid and so furious that it was just being consultative and yeah. you know like you said being on the phone from eight to four eight to five and going home and being with their families but what i wanted to bring up was you know have you seen uh that that sort of model works well with like a low price point high transactional product model um or do you do you feel that it's kind of a balance and it depends on just you know the strengths of the players and the breakdown of the organization I think it definitely depends. I mean, I, I think the 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 more commoditized the product is in the shorter term sales cycle, the less experienced you have to be. But all I look at is, you know, if you pay attention to to challenger sale and you know all the stats, you know, by the time somebody comes to us, they're already sixty to seventy percent of the way through the sales process. I mean, I think a lot of people misconstrue that stat. You know, people think that everybody's already sixty to seventy. No, the people who literally Google and then put the form in and say, hey, I'm interested, those people are already sixty to seventy percent of the way through. And if you just tie that to, okay, so you have somebody who's done their research on a product or service or whatever it is, and they fill out that form, and then they get some 22-year-old kid who, who has no idea, where, you know, and, and is being told to run through BANT and make sure it's qualified, that type of thing. Like, I, as a buyer, that's not a good experience for me. You know, it, and, and the analogy I use is, say, say your, you know, your iPhone or your, you know, cable bill or something like that. Like, say, say your iPhone, you need, you need help with it, so you call Verizon or whoever. You've already rebooted. You've already kind of done the basics, right? So you get on the phone with some kid who's going to ask you, okay, have you rebooted? Have you done this? And you're going to spend a half an hour with that kid saying, yep, no, whatever. And then they'll be like, okay, so now I have to evolve. Now I have to give you over to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about, right? I got to elevate this to a technical resource here. And then you flip over to that technical resource and that technical resource says, oh, so how can I help you? And you're like, what the fuck? Like, I... Did that kid, did, did that person just not, I spent a half an hour explaining what my problem was and, and that, did they take any notes? And that handoff is just an atrocious handoff. So I know we're going to get into this, but I actually think personally, I think the whole predictable revenue model of SDR, BDR, AE is going to, is going to have to evolve because it's just not customer centric the way that most companies apply it. It can be customer centric if the handoffs between the S, you know, between the SEO inbound and the SDR and the AE are smooth as shit, and and there's like some very structured things in place there. It can be smooth, but 90 plus percent of the companies that I work with, it ain't that smooth. You know what I mean? So you know, it's it's really important to to pay attention to the user experience throughout this process. I think for the since predictable revenue came out. 
uh, with Salesforce, I think everybody's been very focused on 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 how to scale our business. Like how how can I apply this model to scale my business, which is fantastic, right? Because it is a very scalable model. SDR, VDR, AE, you know, SMB, mid-market enterprise. Now you have this long progression of a, of a sales rep and you can promote all the way through that and you know give more money all the way through that too. But if we flip it over and put it on the customer side, that experience, mm. Mm, yeah. And, and since now everything is moving towards the customer experience and, and really making sure that it's seamless. I mean, we're playing around with stuff like drift and those type of things. And it's like, you know, all of a sudden the, the customer experience is the number one thing that we should be focusing on, which means I think we should take a look at the model that we put together here and say, how do we need to address this to address that? <laughs> that's, that's it right there. Boom. Uh, Morgan, anything to add before we move on? No, no, nothing to add. Let's, let's hop right into it. Okay, so, let's do it. First question is, and this is what we've already touched on, so this is why we're hopping to it. Why is the SEO role no longer an entry-level position? So here are my thoughts. I know, John, we talked about this. My thing is, at, it stands right now, you have to know how to reach out to a high-level executive for most organizations. You have to hand this off to an account executive who may or may not be picky. And then you also have to make sure that the message resonates because there are a thousand other emails and calls that are happening. You also have to be relevant on social for the most part because if someone doesn't know you, they may not read your email or they may not pick up the phone. And then you also have to understand the evolution of the tools that are coming out. So with all that happening, I, I just don't, I can't see the SDR role being an entry level position because there are so many things that you have to do. And also you're held to a quota and you're the expectations of you are high. And as I take, tell every single sales development team that I talk to, the almost insanity of you walking into work every single day knowing that you're going to get rejected is kind of cryptic to some degree, right? <laughs> like you're walking into work knowing that you're going to get rejected and that you may fail. That's really tough for a lot of people, especially that you're coming into a new position, new organization, and a new industry. So I don't think it's no, I don't think it's any longer an initial position. And I see it as my standpoint is we're going to go into where the SDR position is the next position from what I believe is the, going to be the new entry-level position, which is the sales development analyst, the sales development researcher, your purebred prospector, or the, whatever you want to call that. So this person is going to be in the weeds. They're going to be prospecting accounts, prospecting contacts, putting them into Salesforce, and then handing them off to the SDRs that will be doing active prospecting, gives them more time for specialization, more time for them to resonate with their future customers and making sure that the front line of your brand is intact because the SDRs are your brand. And for every single CEO in a tech company, that is your one of your main priorities is like, what is our brand out in the marketplace? Are they talking bad, of us, bad about us? Are they talking good about us? Are we in the spotlight as a leading indicator in our industry? Are we not a category leader in our industry? An SDR is going to obtain that because if your SDRs are just throwing stuff across the wall, nothing's happening, they're not specialized, they're reaching out to the wrong accounts, they're all tier threes, you're putting yourself in a bad spot as an organization and you won't get any pipeline for the account executives to close. So I believe that the new entry-level role will be the sales development analyst or researcher. They'll be in that role for six to 12 months. They make about 30 to 35K. They're coming out of college, but it gives them the opportunity to go to an SCR and then become an account executive. And now your farmer system, as people like to call the sales development system, or I really like to call it the training ground for the next role they're going to take, is now going to facilitate in a more streamlined process. So that's why I no longer believe the entry level role for the SCR. It's not a thing. SCR, sales development researcher analyst, is going to come into play. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're spot on as far as the, you know, if you, again, going back to the customer experience, if the first experience, they, the first personal experience they have, right? I mean, through, you know, they get you all online and whatever, and I can click through stuff. But when I talk to a person, if that experience isn't pretty solid, um, I'm going to go someplace else. And if I get frustrated with that first interaction because the, the person over the phone doesn't know what they're talking about or they're obviously reading through a script, you know, or they're literally just checking off boxes, I'm going to get off that phone quick and I'm going to go find somebody else who knows what the hell they're talking about. So I think it, it, 
right now it's an entry level role. But again, I think we're in this shift right now because I think everybody's still looking at it as, okay, the, the brand new kid out of college is the inbound SDR. Then they get grad, you know, so that they can get their teeth cut a little bit and understand what it's like to take that ass whooping that, that Morgan was just talking about. And then, you know, and then evolve to an SDR doing outbound stuff and then, you know, move on from there. I think that I think that whole thing shift in anyways, because of what we're going to hit on a little bit later, which is the tech, the, the rise of the tech stack. Right. I mean, I'm watching and um, just I know that you're talking about like the size of deal that matters. Right. Because SMB mid market enterprise, the SMB SDR, that is getting replaced that that I mean, Morgan and I were just on a, a call yesterday with what it was a scale X. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was ScaleX, you know, Chad Burmeister went over there and, and, and they're doing like personalization, like real personalization at scale with AI. And they're doing like what, what I guess, I don't know what the stat is, like what 40 SDRs can do in a day that they can do it with one SDR with this tool. Right. And, and that is totally valid as far as volume is concerned. You know what I mean? If you can tweak up a little bit of personal stuff with some AI and crank that out to, you know, 100, 200, 400, 500 accounts a day, then go for it, right? Let technology take care of that, where we're going to start to see it evolve. And this is why the SDR role needs to evolve is because that technology is going to start doing this and eating away at that, the need for that 22 year old kid cranking out those emails with outreach and uh, sales loft and whatever. And they're going to move up to, to the you know, mid market and enterprise and with a whole account based marketing and all that stuff. You know, again, if you have a kid who doesn't know what they're talking about calling into mid markets and enterprise, they're going to get their asses handed to them, right? Because yep. the client's just not going to be, not going to tolerate a little bit of a, you know, a bullshit. I mean, Morgan, you're, 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 chime in here. I mean, I'm, I'm listening to your calls, right? I mean, a lot of times what you're trying to do is, you know, because I've heard some of your calls that he sends over to me and it's like, you know, your close is, hey, I'm trying to close you on a meeting. So, right. So, hey, the reason for my call today is blah, blah, blah. And I was just looking for a few minutes of your time to see if we could talk through this in detail. A lot of people right then and there say, okay, kid, you caught me, right? Like, what do you want to talk about? And if, and if you aren't savvy enough to be able to jump into that conversation, you're going to lose out on an opportunity because somebody's going to be, because if you're like, well, no, I don't really have the expertise to be able to have that, you know, initial conversation, um, then it's like, okay, never mind. You know what I mean? Like you got my attention here and you, you struck gold, kid. You picked, you know, I picked up the phone. Yeah. Holy shit. Right. And, and if you don't, if you can't capitalize on that right now, you're missing, you're going to miss out on a massive opportunity, which is why that SDR needs to be, it needs to evolve. Yeah, it does. It does. And a quick contact to the, on that before we hop on to the next question. You, you have to be prepared. I send John almost every single call that I have. If, I mean, if someone bulldozes me, then it is what it is. Can't, there's no, you can't. I like listening to those two, man. Those, those, <laughs> those make me laugh. <laughs> I'm in that one call where that's that place in the world. It was funny. They were like, nope, not interested, hung up. And I was like, all right, whatever. They're funny. But at the end of the day, what I've realized is when someone is like, hey, you caught me, what do you got? You have to be ready. You can't just be like, oh, well, do you want to talk for 30 minutes? You haven't given enough value for them to be on a call with you for 30 minutes. Time is the most valuable asset that we have, and I'm not willy-nilly going to go on 30 minutes on a call. I know John's not. I know Gitano's not. So you got to provide value in those conversations. And what I've also realized is prospects are going to challenge you just with questions just to challenge you. Mm -hmm. So there's one call that I sent to John, and this prospect was asking me all these questions that they really aren't – I could tell that they really weren't interested in what – my answer was they were just seeing that I even have an answer for the question. They're just trying to stump you. Yeah, they were yeah. trying to stump you to be like, yep, this kid just called me for no reason. But no, I was on point. I answered it. And then we ended up facilitating a follow-up call, which ended up in a meeting. But if I had stumbled or if I was like, I don't know that, or I was like, oh, uh, well, I'll get back to you, he would have been like, hey, uh, thanks, but no thanks. I'm out of here. Yep. So I think, it's under, I think it's important to understand what's your web talk track? What are the objections that you face on a daily basis? And how can you put yourself in a spotlight when you get on the phone with someone? And most of the executives that I talk to, because I call into sales, I've called into marketing, is it really comes down to confidence because if I don't have confidence in myself, the prospect's not going to have confidence in me. I think number two is understanding your persona. If you understand the persona, you understand what they're going through, you understand their priorities, you can tailor your pitch in a way to be like, that's exactly what we're looking for. So I think that's where you have to really understand as an SCR to understand those components. And that goes beyond just entry level position. Like you got to do your research you got to be practicing this and you have to be ready. You can't treat a sales call like an event. 
Yeah, and actually just one more thing before we move on to the next slide. I think that it's, a, it's you know, somebody asked me a while back, you know, John, now that you're in your 40s here, you know, if you could go back and tell your, tw you know, your 22-year-old self something, what would it be? <clears throat> and, um, you know, my, my first answer to that was A-B split test, right? A-B split test, everything you do. But my second answer to that was, you know, I'd be a lot more proactive with my business acumen in the sense that I, my business acumen used to be, it, it, it was a byproduct of my activity. I would, I would go, 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 right? Because the only thing I felt like I could control at 22 years old was my effort. So I said, screw it. I'm just going to work harder than everybody else. I'm going to try more things than everybody else. But it was the whole touch the stove thing, right? It's like, oh, I touched the stove. Well, that's hot. I shouldn't do that anymore. Let's, you know, let's do this. So for instance, I would ask a, a stupid question to a CEO and the CEO would straight up say, that's a stupid question. And I'd be like, okay, well, you're probably not going to ask that again. Um, yeah. but, but it was very reactive in nature. And it was almost through osmosis that I picked up business acumen. If I had to do it all over again, I would be much more proactive with my business acumen as a rep and educating myself on stuff like Morgan's talking about personas and the industry and reading books that executives read so I can have those conversations, you know, jumping into those LinkedIn groups that, where they're asking questions, not to troll for leads, but to actually listen, right? Yeah. And I also, as a manager, I would have been a lot more, I, I would have tried to help my reps become a lot more uh, improve their business acumen, right? And it's, uh, that's what I, that's a, a huge gap that I'm seeing that is going to prevent the SDR role from evolving to that next level is that business acumen piece that, that nobody's really being proactive about right now for the yeah. 22 to 26 year old, 28 year old kid. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, and for the people listening, uh, we have a, a SAS metrics blueprint from Jocko. Uh, so make sure you check that out if uh, you need to get up to speed on SAS metrics. If you're an SDR, you should definitely know your, your basic SAS metrics. That's a must. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have uh, published the, uh, the ultimate glossary for sales and marketing and technology. So every single abbreviation and definition mm -hmm. that you need to know, there's over 300 of them in there. So you can find that on saleshacker.com as well if you need to. Uh, so uh, we also have a, a ton, and I mean a ton of questions coming in. I don't think we'll be able to, to go through them all right now. So let's plow through the presentation, and then yeah, let's again, guys, we'll, we'll get to as many as we can. So yeah, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, so keep them coming in. Uh, I, I'm not ignoring you. I see them coming in on the side. They're flying in like crazy, but uh, we're going to try to save them for the end and plow through them uh, at the end. So uh, Morgan, let's continue. Yeah, so this is the next question, and I kind of touched on this already. Does there need to be a position before you become an SDR? Uh, I know John probably got a little more context on this. Like I said, I feel like the sales development analyst is the position before the SDR. If you want to get super granular, I think inbound and then outbound. Some people disagree with that. They say outbound, then inbound. They want their more experienced reps to handle the inbounds. Depends on your organization, depends on your deal size, and also how many deals you're sending over. I, I still believe that this research position is going to be critical. Uh, I think the position of that now is the SCR intern. So we had that when I was previously at Termis. It was the same essential thing that I just said. But I think having it a full-time integrated position, having them fill a part of the team, it's going to make your SCRs lock, locked in. And from the SCRs that I coached and managed, when they came from the SCR intern, which is this SCR analyst role, what I'm talking about, they were way more equipped. Uh, I didn't. I never had to. I never had any problems with them in prospecting. The only thing I had to coach them on was messaging. And once they had the messaging down, they became one of the top reps. So that's that's my take on that, and that's why I'm I'm saying that there definitely needs to be a role before an SCR. Yeah, and I th and I'm going to put this in a little bit of a bigger context of of where I see just in general things going. Going back to what I was saying earlier about the breaking or the evolution of the full blown predictable revenue model. I actually think, you know, because I'm starting to hear a lot of stuff about pods, right? Uh, we're moving into this pod thing where, you know, you have a group of people that are focused on the ABM or, the, you know, that type of stuff. And again, that's only relevant when people talk about a comp based marketing that is only relevant to mid market, mostly enterprise. It's not relevant to SMB. Um, maybe it will be with the AI and stuff like that, but probably not for a while. But what I think is going to actually happen, the, the missing link, and this is I've also done a couple of presentations on this one, which is the missing link between sales and marketing. And look, I've been, I, I have a, my, my degree is in marketing. That's what I got my degree in. But I'm in sales for 22 years. And when I got out of school, I was hearing about the sales and marketing divide. And 22 year, years later, I'm still hearing about the sales and marketing divide. And, and I think the answer is this more of a pod approach where you take somebody like what Morgan's talking about, more of a... Uh, an analyst or a data person, if you will. So some kid they, they, who, who comes out of college who's really good at spreadsheets and looking at data and information, right? 
and I actually think it might be a marketing intern or a marketing of a, a, a ground floor marketing intro again 30 40 50 grand a year whatever it is whatever the company can afford and what they do is they sit with a team of like one SDR to three AEs right and maybe an SE on the team right so there's your that's your typical pod right now is one SDR to three AEs and maybe an SE in there what's missing out of that is marketing Right. Because what happens is the big marketing departments like says, hey, we're trying to do all this ABM, but we have all these little pods all over. So how can you really do ABM by by focusing on 10 different teams of that? Right. Um, the marketing department doesn't have the resources to understand all that as much. But if you put like a low like a entry level marketing person on that team as part of their pod. That's the person who cleans up the database. That's the person who runs the reports. That's the person who looks at the, the, the numbers because sales reps never do it. Let's, let's be honest, like sales reps just suck at looking at data and, and, and they never will. It's just not part of their, you know, it's just not part of their skill set. That's not what they're good at. And so, but that person then takes that data and then goes back to the big marketing department and says, hey, my team needs, this is what my team needs. This is the content my team needs, right? Uh, so that we can do our account-based marketing stuff, right? And that connector there, now that person can go into sales, you know, because now they've got the data and the analytics and that type of stuff, and they've seen what it take, takes to be in sales. So they could evolve into an SDR and then an AE and that type of stuff, or they could go under marketing and, and more operations which is ultimately where I think that the SDR role as it stands today, I think the SDR role as it stands today is going to evolve much more under marketing and operations than it is going to be sales, period. Um, it, it makes me wonder, and I know that's the question we're coming up to in here, which is what does that mean? Like where's the entry level going to be now? And are we going to revert back to one sales rep managing the entire sales process? Who knows? But all I know is that this, as it stands today, it has to evolve. And, and I think that little marketing, that, that frontline person is a great way to connect the dots. Yeah, and John, like that, that's amazing insight right there. And the crazy part is that that marketing research role has like been around, you know, long yeah. before like Morgan's talking about, you know, uh, the, the sales research yeah. role yeah. as the, the beginning point to what an SDR will be. You know, marketing has had that luxury for a while. There's been like junior yeah. marketing analyst roles like that entry level thing. Like we don't just have marketers uh, that don't know any better how to do outreach to reach out to like these big publications to get us featured and get us backlinks right. and all this stuff. So why in sales uh, is the expectation different? So uh, it, it really struck a chord with me there, what you just said. But I'm curious, uh, just before we move on, like, are you guys starting to see that research role um, emerge more and more and more? Or is it still this thing that's like kind of in the dark that's still kind of coming up slowly? I, I'm seeing it. Um, you know, it's, it, I'm, I'm more of Morgan, though. It's, it, I think it's more of the intern right now. It's not the full-time position. Um, so I think that's what's starting to percolate a lot heavier in as opposed to the kid who's in college that, you know, the internship. But I see a, a ton of interns right now because data, I will say, out of everything that we talk about, sales and marketing, the number one uh, inhibitor, I guess, if you will, of any of its success is the quality of the data. And most clients that I work with, their data sucks. The stuff that they have in their CRM is abysmal, right? They just, you know, there's, there's no con their contact information isn't, you know, there. The, they have to search five, ten minutes to find somebody to make sure it's not deduped in another system. They can't run reports off of stuff. So in, inevitably, and, and that's like, you know, I talked about AI before. Like AI only matters when you have a massive data set and the data is accurate. If the data isn't accurate, AI isn't going to do shit for you. It's actually probably going to do bad for you because it's going to start pushing you in the wrong direction, right? So that's why I think it's, it's you know, it, it should be a position that, that continues to evolve and, and actually becomes pretty important in the, uh, in the success of an organization. So I've seen it from an SDR Perfect. intern standpoint, and I've heard more people talking about making this a position. I was on the call the other day with somebody, and they was like, yeah, this is something I want to do. So I think it's going to start happening. I don't, it's not, it's not going to be mainstream for, for quite a while here as people still try to figure out what an SDR is, ADR, BDR, all the different that's XDRs all. that are out there. So once that's all figured out, I think you'll start seeing that, um, that sales development analyst researcher. Cool. Cool. So, Let's continue. Let's continue. So we're gonna, guys, we're gonna, we're gonna go through these really fast because we want to make sure that we answer your questions. And so these are gonna be super high level, super quick. We're gonna go through these fast. So number one point: the current state of an SDR. This is stuff we've already talked about for the most part. I, I do believe that 
what will affect the current state of the SDR is AI and technology and in a good way. So if you're a great rep, a good rep already, you should be excited. If you're an average rep, you should be afraid. So that's what John talks about, like the death of the average sales rep. You should be trying to figure out how you can level up. And I do believe that the change status of today is just understanding what your personas are, understanding what the skill sets you need to be enhancing on top of every single day. And then also, what are the things I need to be listening to from a podcast standpoint? What do I need to be listening to from a YouTube standpoint on my skill sets, how I can get better as an SCR? And then also other people's personas and how other people are doing it well. How are they doing it? How can I implement that inside of my process? Yeah, and, and I'll just chime in. You know, I, I wrote a post a little while ago. I think the SDR role is the hardest job in sales because it is, first of all, it's entry based on everything that Morgan said. You know, it's like, okay, we have to know all these tools and technologies and stuff. Second of all, the question is how much value do you add, right? Because if you add too much value to the conversation uh, with the client, then they see no value in having a conversation with the AE. But if you don't have enough value, then I don't see, the, you know, taking that next step with you. So how much value do you add there? And then the third thing is, is usually one SDR is, is, is you know, managing three AEs. Yep. And, you know, that, that three AEs, are three different likes and dislikes, three different attitudes, three different approaches, all that stuff. And so yet you're, you're asking this 22-year-old, 23, 24-year-old kid to manage all of that. It's a tough spot, right? And also you have managers like me, Gen Xers and above, who are still stuck in the volume mentality. Right. Which is everybody knows that quality is the answer right now. But we're but guys like me, I mean, when I grew up in sales, it, you know, when I was first in sales in, in 1998, 1999, like straight up, it was reco style. It was get on. The, if I was on email, it was like, get the fuck off the of email. Right. It was like, no, 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 no. And so that's that's how I grew up. So how do, if I'm managing, that's what I can hold on to. You know what I mean? That's why, like, out of anything else, I just want to hear you. I, I just want to hear you on the phone. I, I just want to make your ears bleed. And so that's why I think the SDR role is right now, currently in this, in this, it's almost like a bipolar thing that we're asking them to do these, all this like high quality shit, but we're forcing it down their throat that they have to hit fifty dollars a day and hundred dollars a day, which I think is insanity. It's crazy. That's a, that's a that's keep dialing at its worst. <laughs> 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 so number two is long-term vision of an SDR. So this is one thing that as from a leadership standpoint, when I was a manager and one thing that my previous manager boss did for me that I appreciate to this day is like, Hey, look, what do you want to do five years from now? What do you want to accomplish a year from now? And how can I help you pass basically the checkpoint in that 90 day realm? Because in three months you figure out is an SDR going to make it or they're not going to make it. I believe that's the 90 day mark is where you figure that out. So it's really understanding what do you want to do with sales development? Do you want to go into customer success? Do you want to become a leader? Do you want to become a closer? Do you want to continuously be in sales development for the rest of your career? Do you want to go manager of sales development, then director of sales development, then vice president of sales development? You have to figure that out as you're in your SDR role. I personally, I don't see, I don't see anyone coming out the gates like normally being like, okay, month one, this is exactly what I want to do. I was fortunate enough to be like, these are the things exactly I want to do. And it's worked out for me so far. But most people coming out of college, two years out of college, three years out of college, they don't know exactly what they want to do. But I do believe if you treat sales development seriously, and you're not just treating it as the gateway or the drawbridge to be an account executive, then you'll learn your business acumen. You'll put yourself in a long-term thinking mindset, which is how you win at the end of the day. And how you really set yourself for, for a vision is writing down your strengths and weaknesses, what you love to do, what you hate to do. And that's what I did coming out of college. That was the most beneficial experiment for me because I figured out, wait, these are the things I want to do. And I also align myself with my other friends and we mapped out what we wanted to do in the long term. So I feel like that's what an SCR needs to do to be increasingly successful because you have something to strive for. You're not going to get bogged down by the highs and lows. You keep a steady mindset and that's how you see success. Yeah, so I'll take it from two different angles. I think the SDR role, like I said, is going to evolve more under sale, uh, marketing and operations than it is sales. And I think it's actually going to come, like what Morgan said, there's going to be SDR, SDR manager, SDR director, SDR VP. And then that VP is now going to report under marketing. And it'll help you determine whether you want to stay in sales, right, because there's still that connection there, or get more into operations or marketing. Um, so it'll give you, I think it'll get you exposed to all that stuff. Now, as Morgan said, you kind of kind of, pick your head up a little bit and say, what do I like about this while also, while not disregarding 
what you don't like, you, you know, because a lot of like, look, the SDR role getting told nine, no 99 out of 100 times. Nobody likes that. But but there's a certain part of going through that that'll make you a much better sales professional or professional in general by taking that beating and being, you know, and being focused on crushing that role. Because once you crush that role, it kind of then opens up. OK, well, where do you want to go? I mean, I, I remember as a manager, you know, if a kid was crushing it on my team, the, the world was his or hers. You know what I mean? Like at, when it came time for their promotion, I, it wasn't, okay, now you're going to be a, an AE or whatever. It was, what do you want to do, man? You, you're crushing it. What do you like to do here? I want to keep you because you're talent. And that's the most important thing. Like you keep talent, you have good talent on your team. It solves almost all problems. Yep. So I got a kid who's absolutely heads down. I know one of the questions that comes up is like, what are the what are the characteristics you look for in a you know in an SDR or somebody coming in? To me, it's straight up work ethic. You know what I mean? Somebody who worked their way through college, somebody who t can take rejection, has a good attitude no matter how many times they get knocked down. That kid comes in, executes at whatever level they're at. Psh, shit, world's open for them. Yep, I agree. Yeah, so I love this it. Goes, and this goes into number three. So this is the tools of an SDR. You got to understand what tools are out there. You have to leverage them. I'm not saying use every single tool. If I use every single tool that I knew about, I'd get absolutely nothing done. And John would probably be really upset with me. So, <laughs> so you got to find the tools that work for you. For me, it's nudge. I've been getting more integrated in that it helps me with my persona based messaging. It helps with my personalization. I try to send three to five personalized, like hyper personalized emails every single day. It also helps me keep tabs on the accounts that I'm currently working on and send them relevant information. Uh, sales off, my actually the sales off office right now, use them. And then also I like looking at LinkedIn Sales Navigator. It's one of my favorite tools. If you're a salesperson and you don't have that tool, you need to invest into it. It's a game changer. Aller, I like seeing what people's competitors are and also news. And then Feedly as well and also Vidyard. Those are my main tools that I use on a daily basis to make sure that I'm getting in front of the right people. But also this is something that I know John's going to be super fired about and go really in detail about. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take his fire here. But just don't turn into a marketing auto automation robot. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, you can easily turn into a robot and just send out the messages like everyone else can, and that's not gonna separate you, and that's not gonna help you stand out from the noise, which is what we're gonna talk about next. And hey, Morgan, sorry to jump in real quick. <clears throat> can you can you repeat the name of those tools? But uh, just do it a little bit slowly. We have a bunch of. Uh, questions coming in that they want you to repeat the name of those tools a little bit slower. <laughs> That's that Northeast coming out of me, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's gone too long. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Sales Loft, Vidyard, Owler, Nudge, I think I mentioned Feedly. Feedly. And I think there's another one, right? That I said? I think those are the main ones. Yeah, those are the main ones. Oh. So. Yeah. Google Alerts is another one if you want to do really cheap yeah. monitoring for like a certain keyword or something. Right. Uh, Owler, that like that's why Owler is one of our favorites because it kind of does that. But yeah, I, I think anything, right? I, I think, out of, you know, out of specific tools, I think, you know, Morgan named them. But I think you should look at something to track whatever you're doing, right? So obviously Salesforce or, or whatever your CRM is, but some type of tool that you can split test. One is going back to the, what's the number one thing I would recommend is, is – is something that I could do so when I if I sent out 25 emails and then another 25 emails I had something to say okay which one's got me a higher open rate response rate that type of thing so something like a sales loft but to Morgan's like Morgan said you know I can't stand it when reps are using these tools and turning into robots like sales loft and outreach and those type of tools reps are using them as sales automation tools when they should be sales efficiency tools so if you don't, if you just keep cranking out shit and you're not putting any thought at all into what you're doing other than pushing play and taking the templates that marketing is giving you and doing that, there, I could name 50 different technologies that can do that better than you can. You know what I mean? And most of them are the marketing automation stuff, the Marketos, the Eloquiz, the Pardots of the world, you know, that type of stuff. And so those, you know, something to track but not automate and then the other thing is, is something to give you insights into your target audience, whether that's Owl or Google Alerts or something like that, so that the information comes to you, so you're not always going out and having to do research on every single account you want to send an email to. Yeah. So that, you know, Sales Navigator, Owl or you know, whatever, but just something to have that intel come to you. Yep. Cool. Perfect. And this is the last one here, standing out from the noise. Uh, 
I think you have to do this now. There, there's, there, really is, <laughs> there really is not a lot of decision making on this one for me because I, I just took a poll. My, the very first conference I went to as a rep and was actively out there prospecting, I asked every single executive, like we had a good conversation, was like how many emails do you get a day? 200 and 300 emails, solicited emails. Okay, how many phone calls are you getting a day? About 10, that's a lot. So it's like, how are you gonna stand out? You gotta leverage the channels. Nudge, again, you gotta use tools. I think LinkedIn, you gotta look what's going on. I think posting content. So this is something that I've started to take more of a deeper dive into, becoming a subject matter expert. So I'll never say that I am one, but other people will, and I'll take that validation. But I think at the end of the day, everyone can become that. And what I really mean by that is not a thought leader, it's what a lot of people are thinking right now. That's not what I'm saying. Subject matter expert is reading the material, studying the material, giving your thoughts on it, regurgitating those thoughts on what you believe is right, and then also spitting that back out in your own context to the prospects and showing that you know what your industry is about, you understand your product, and you understand your solution. I believe that that's what a subject matter expert is. So, for example, if I decided, you know what, I don't care about sales development anymore, I don't care about sales training, I'm going to start studying LaCroix, right, and I become a subject matter expert in LaCroix. I could do that if I spent hours and hours and hours and hours studying it, understanding the dynamics behind it. I could do that, but I feel like that can be done for anybody in any industry. And that's going to help you stand out from the noise because you're going to be sharing articles, you're going to be talking to your prospects in the same language as them. It's going to resonate and it's going to put yourself in a good spotlight. So people that stand out from the noise really well, obviously John does a great job. Most people know his brand. Gary Vaynerchuk's another great example. You see him everywhere. And I think another person who does that really, really well is uh, Tony Robbins as well because people pay a lot of money to just go and hear from him on his subject matter expertise in psychology and business. So I feel like those are ways that you can get yourself out there, sharing blogs on relative content, posting videos of yourself talking about your product and solution, and putting yourself out there, leveraging channels where your audience is, and talking to them on their terms. Yeah, I got yeah. two to add. One is just work your ass off. I'm sorry. The word, the work ethic thing right now pisses me off. Like I, I trained, I trained literally three, a de three a week I, at least. Right. So again, 85 last year, 90 last year, whatever it is. I can't. So what happens is I train 8:30 to 4:30, right? And then at 4:30, done. And usually I sit there and you know, kind of check my emails and kind of get ready before I go to the airport. When I leave the office at five o'clock, 5:30, it's a fucking ghost town. I just don't understand if you are if you are committed to being great at your profession. I don't say you have to stay until nine o'clock at night every night, but literally every office I go to is a ghost town at five o'clock at night. Every single night. Are you shitting me right now? So that's one. If, I, if I'm a manager and I'm walking out of the office and I see a kid still sitting there at 630 banging away on, you know, trying to figure things out like that kid standing out, period. Yeah. Um, proactively look for uh, uh, feedback. So do yourselves a favor. Here's a couple of tips for everybody out there. If you want to get on the top of your manager's list, cold call your manager, leave your manager a voicemail, ask for feedback, ask your manager to sit in and listen to a couple of calls. Don't have them be coming over and say, Hey, can I listen into your calls? Ask them to come in and say, could you listen to some of my calls and give me some feedback mm -hmm. here? That's how you stand out. And then the last thing I'll say is examples of people who do it. You're looking at one right now, Morgan, and be, he is here right now with me at Jay Barrows because Morgan took his brand seriously. At 22 years, at 23 years old, the kid went out there. He started putting videos out there, putting content out there, not pretending like he was a thought leader, but really doing it in a genuine way, sharing what he was learning along the way. And that's what it is. It's like you don't want to sit there and spout off that, hey, look at me. I'm the smartest person out there, and this is you should pay attention to me. This is the way you do it is by reading stuff that's interesting to you, uh, trying different shit out, and then getting on a video or writing a blog and being like, hey, I tried this, and this is what happened. It was either super successful, and I think you should probably do it too or holy shit that was a disaster um don't do that okay it, like not that you should do this because i'm telling you because i'm smart but i tried it and whoa you know don't do that so those are right. ways that you can stand out to, from the crowd because it's actually in my opinion not that hard to stand out these days unfortunately yeah i, I would agree and for everybody on the on the webinar that uh wants to even take a stab at this and feel like they might have uh, earned their stripes and feel like they're ready I run all the content for Sales Hacker 
Uh, so uh, what, what John just said is exactly the type of content we're looking for. I did this, this was the outcome, and this is what you should do if you want to be successful. We want right. real tactical takeaways from experiments that you've ran. Maybe you've switched up your call cadences, you've tweaked this in your email cadences, whatever have you. Uh, that opportunity is available for you guys if you want. So uh, just make sure it's tactical and, and follows what uh, best practices that John and Morgan just outlined for you. But uh, Morgan, why don't you take us through the key takeaways before we get to the questions? Yeah. So, yeah. And what you, what you said that there is, is critical. Share your journey and a lot of people will follow along the skill set. So here are the key takeaways that you guys should got this. Uh, you learn how to leverage your SEO role for the long-term career. How do, you, how do you use the tools around you to be successful? How to gain someone's attention in a noisy world? And the steps of mastering your craft daily in sales development, which I feel like a lot of questions are going to be revolved around that. So those are the key takeaways. Um, real quick, I'll just touch on this high, high level because I want to get into questions. Uh, in the past, you guys see, I, I just, John made me watch this movie, Glenn Glary, Glenn Ross. So it's a classic sales movie, massively depressing. <laughs> massively depressing. But it was a great sales movie. But the thing is, in that movie, in the past, this is what they were talking about. Always be closing, blasting out tip emails to a ton of leads, being super aggressive with follow-up, making a ton of cold calls. That's changing. In the current, we're making quality calls, streamlined process, sending out targeted emails, and always provide value. And I believe the new, which is I see like in a year from now, the current's like what's happening now, new is in a year. Doing research before the call, making sure to follow up with purpose, reaching out with persona-based messaging. I feel like that's going to be way more integral as we move on here in sales development. And then... ABL, which is always be listening. I feel like a lot of people just don't listen. I'm a victim of that. I didn't listen at all when I came in SDR. I normally don't listen, but I've learned to listen more through social, on the phone, on my calls, through email, and I'm able to provide the right value. So that's how, that, those are my thoughts right there. Cool. That's phenomenal. We already have people asking uh, <clears throat> for the deck because that, uh, that slide right there, I think, struck a chord with some people. So we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be sending out the deck to everybody asking about uh, the deck and the video follow-up. That's all going to be sent out to you uh, within a few days after the uh, webinar is, is uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel as well. So you can subscribe at saleshacker.com for all of our, our video content there. But um, I, on, I just want to say, you know, on behalf of... Uh, the SDR community, you know, with Morgan and John on the call, uh, I, I don't like being rejected. And actually, that is something that's very difficult for me. Uh, and that is why I went into the inbound marketing role, mm. because I would rather create stuff that people will find and, you know, they'll come to me. I don't like outbound. I don't like being rejected. And it's not something that I, I can really sit, uh, sit well with at night. So I, I applaud uh, the uh, the outbound sales community, the SDRs out there grinding and you know getting rejected. It's it's tough, and it's it's specifically why I didn't go into it myself. So um, you know, hats off to you guys. Send them my props, and uh, let, let's jump into some questions real quick. So um, let's go through them. There's so many. Uh, somebody shouted you out, John. Uh, John is such a real person. This is totally refreshing to me, even though I've been in enterprise sales for over a decade. That's what's up. Um, Thanks. But here was one that I that I really liked. Uh, okay, so when handling pricing requests, and this kind of goes back to like what Morgan was talking about when you know people were just trying to stump them. This 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 sounds like uh, maybe not trying to get stumped, but when handling pricing requests, what's the best way to kind of run the discovery and transition uh, from the inbound SDR to AD to to the AE? So uh, you know, should this kind of be like farmed uh, away uh, on that call and like pushed to the next call or something like that? Or should SDRs be able to provide like pricing information and go that deep into it? So, so this is from an, an inbound or from a cold call? Um, the, the person didn't specify, but the, I guess the gist of the question is when you're, when you're getting requests for pricing, should you pass that off to the AE and kind of use that as leverage to get to the next part of the uh, sales cycle or should SDRs be, be uh, allowed or, or I guess equipped to uh, share some of that information? Yeah, so I got to answer this because I got this a lot and this is my objection handler and most people would move to the next step. Like this is a nine out of 10, this is what happened. So I'd be like, hey, great. You know, that's a great question. A lot of future customers say the same thing. You know, it would be very difficult for me to give you pricing right now because everyone has a very unique case, a, a very unique case. And we want to make sure that your case is unique when we get on the call with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually write that question down. I'll hand it off to our account executive. Uh, I have next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time available. Does that work for you? I do not want to give someone pricing because 
then you're going to go into a pricing gauge debate and they're like, oh, well, someone said this and then they don't even want to talk to you. So I found that that was beneficial. The rep now knows that they're going to ask pricing so they can prepare to answer that accordingly. And I found that the prospect was more than willing to hop on a call after I answered it that way. Yeah, I think it obviously depends on what you're selling and also what your company is putting out there already. A lot of the SaaS companies that I work with, they have, their pricing is on their website. So I think the <clears throat> I think what the SDR can do is say, hey, look, our pricing is on our website. You can take the amount of seats that you think you want and, and do the math. But until I we really understand kind of what your real situation is and, you know, what the breadth and depth of what you're trying to accomplish is, we really can't give you accurate pricing other than what's on that list. So I can give you rate card here because I want to, I do want, I have, you know, there's two philosophies. Don't talk about price at all, right? And build value, build value, build value, then talk about price so you can justify it. Or talk about price up front so you don't waste your time. I'm a little bit in the middle there. I think we should be allowed to give ballpark pricing to say, you know, give or take, but with some intel, like, hey, I'm happy to share with you some ballpark pricing here. How many licenses are you looking for right now? What's, you know, what's your growth projections for the year? And what's, you know, da, 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 da. okay, well, based on that, you're probably in the range of 30 to 50, 000, like a big range, you know, 30 to $50,000. I'm not qualified to give you the exact pricing yet, but is that in the range of something that you're looking for right now? Because look, I, I do want to have that, right? Because if you're, if you're not even remotely close, if you thought this was going to be at like five bucks and it's like, it's, it's like a $40,000 thing. I, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my AE's time either. Right? So I think with a little bit of qualifying information, an, a, an SDR should give kind of ballpark pricing or just point them to the website for the rate card pricing and let them know that, that, that you can get creative or, or, or flexible with the pricing based on the, the size of the opportunity. And by the way, that's a small sidebar here. Uh, remove the word, just nugget here, please remove the word discount out of your vocabulary. Please, everybody who's listening to this, remove the word discount out of your vocabulary and change that word to flexibility or creativity. I have flexibility in my pricing. We can get creative with our pricing. Usually that comes in the form of larger term, con larger term deals or longer term contracts or larger size deals. And when we get to that point, I'll be happy to have that, but get the fucking word discount out of your vocabulary. Yeah. That's gold. That is pure gold. And we hear that come up a lot <clears throat> uh, just within the sales hacker ecosystem of stuff that we do. Uh, here's another one from uh, Tatiana Chua. So uh, when do you think is the right time for an organization to introduce a more entry level position uh, beneath the inbound and the outbound SDRs? Uh, should this decision be based on company growth, uh, size of company employees? Uh, some specific metric that indicates that forecasting is positive enough to, you know, bring this kind of role in. What's what's your take on that, guys? Yeah, that's I guess a, that's a case yeah, by that's case. I, I think it, to me, it would determine on how fast that company wants to grow and what their and the focus that they want the different roles to have. Right. Because some companies are just not big enough. Right. They have that inbound. They, they, they have the inbound SDR and the outbound SDR as the same person. Right. So they're doing both because they're not big enough to segment those roles like Salesforce can do it because they got thousands of sales reps. But most companies that are getting started, they don't have the, the luxury, if you will, of hiring these type of things. So at a certain point, it's just do you have the money to hire somebody like this? Um, and then you kind of take a look at it and say, OK, when are we reaching a point where we can segment these roles? And if you can't afford it, then that's where the intern stuff comes into play. And that's where you just, you know, farm out kids from colleges to come in and do that data analysis stuff for you um, instead of actually hiring it as a full-time position. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's case by case, by case a little bit, little bit different standpoint. I think you have to look at your SDR to AE ratio. How, does, how is that playing out? You have to look at what's the cost of a demo when it's sourced by an SDR. And by looking at that allocation cost, you have to look at, okay, when I when this person is sourcing this, what is the cost of the research and the analyzation of that SDR when they come into that SDR role? So you have to kind of look at all those things, but it really comes down to growth. If you're growing really fast, maybe, yeah, you can hire that person. If you're a steady growth right now, maybe it's not time to hire that person yet. Yeah, and actually Morgan brought up a good point as far as almost kind of know your hourly rate type of thing. 
Like if you can ever hire somebody, like if, if the role that you're hiring is SDR and you're going to spend $50,000 plus, you know, loaded costs, it's going to be an $80,000, $90,000 resource for you. Do you want them to, and, and you could hire a $15,000 a year intern or $20,000 a in year intern so that that sales rep can focus on sales related activities as opposed to admin activities, then you do that all day long, right? You should just read Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. That's like kind of the model on that one. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, we got. I think we have time for like one or two more. Yep. Um, this one comes from Steve Platt, and actually, this is a great question. Um, it kind of, to me, this sounds like almost where that intersection of sales and marketing kind of meet yet again. Uh, how frequently are the personas typically reviewed and changed? It seems that so often the personas are developed from a marketing-only view. Yep. and don't really include the buyer's process and where they are in the uh, sales process and even getting that feedback from the frontline reps who are really getting that knowledge and getting that feedback from the prospects. So uh, how does that kind of all work? Uh, I'll pass that over to you guys. Uh, I'm going to let Morgan jump in here based on the process we went through. Because Morgan, you want to explain kind of how we went through that, I, the, the, the persona stuff and, and you know, yeah. giving it to you versus you doing the homework and keeping it updated? Yep. So it comes down to foundational structure. It's what we've talked about. It's what I worked on with John. It's what we've done together. It comes down to a couple of things. One is understanding what is the priorities of those personas and then having the reps play within that. Now, there is a question that I got after that. I was like, well, would you let a new rep do that? No, I wouldn't. But this comes down to experienced reps that you have and letting them figure out what are the priorities. They need to go do the research and Google. That's what I did. I Googled it. I looked it up on maybe different, some different podcasts that I listen to, YouTube, blog posts. I'm diving deep into that to figure out what are those priorities. So for each one of our main, uh, main personas, I looked at the five main priorities that they had, and then I translated those main priorities into messaging. Uh, once I had translated that to messaging, I found out what are the five triggers that we as a company should look for when we're going after accounts. And then also when I found out the messaging, I inserted that into whatever sales engagement tool that you have. So ours was sales off. So I put that all into sales off to reach out to those personas. So I believe it, it really comes down to creating a structure for your reps to go find that out. When you do give it to the reps, they may see success in the short term. I don't think they'll see success in the long term because it comes back down to the science and the art. So the science is the foundation of the foundation of what John gave me. Hey, these are the personas that we have. These are some triggers that we're going after good luck, <laughs> go and find it out. And then the art is me putting my messaging, my voice into that when I'm reaching out. So when I'm reaching out to these different prospects, they know it's me and it's not John who sat in the background and crafted it all for me. Yeah. And then just to throw it out there, I do it yearly. So I got a resource that we use. It used to be called Hourly Nerd. I think it's called Catalyst now or something like that. That I, you know, and this is what we bring to, this is what we do for our clients too. When we bring them, um, I got this big worksheet that is the top priorities of the top executives in the top industries in 2018. So every year in December, I have a group go out there and there's 10 different industries and there's 10 different titles in each industry. And it's basically, you know, you can do this yourself. You just Google it like CIO healthcare priority 2018, because unfortunately most personas are very static. Like the person said, right? It's like, Oh, CTOs, they care about technology and innovation and, and it's look at Bill and he cares about the, you know, and it's like, yeah, thanks. But look, a CIO in the healthcare industry cares about different shit than a CIO in the manufacturing industry. A CIO in the healthcare industry in 2018 has different priorities than a CIO in the healthcare industry did in 2017. And if you're, so if you're not updating your shit on a regular basis and at least letting your reps understand and do those Google searches every once in a while and have them give you feedback, then I think you're doing everybody a disservice. Um, but yeah, I think you should at least update them yearly because priorities change yearly. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and these are such good answers. We, we only got time for one more question, guys. There's still so many more coming in. I can't even believe how many we have. I actually gave up my email and said, you know, if you and, and our emails are all uh, uh, up on on the screen right now, guys. If you really want to follow up and, and get real specific about anything, but here's the last one for today. Uh, it comes from uh, Lauren uh, Salanitro. Um, there seems to be a stigma in the workplace about being an SDR. This often leads to SDRs being poor, poorly treated, blamed for a lot of stuff. Um, and, and also kind of uh, 
put into this box where uh, SDRs can't feel like they're uh, being able to be creative. They're in this sort of uh, role where they can't really practice creativity. So I guess um, the first part of it is how can SDRs kind of combat that stigma? And then number two, what can SDRs do to get creative and have a little fun uh, with their role instead of feeling like they're kind of in this hamster wheel of like churn and burn? Uh, you more, you want to take that first one? I'll take the second one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think when it comes to being creative as an SCR and making sure that you're not feeling like you're at the bottom of the totem pole, I think it comes back to what it also comes back to what organization you're in because obviously being an SCR at a really large company and being an SCR at a smaller company, the amount of like flexibility you're going to have is going to be completely different first off. So I'm going to start off with that. But I think what it really comes down is you have to understand what are your strengths, what gets you excited, and how are you going to test different things out on a, on a daily basis to keep yourself engaged. So for me, uh, one of the things I did is I always tried out something new. I'm trying out a new tool like Vidyard. When it first came out, I tried it out. And nobody, Everyone was like, what is this? And I was like, I'll figure it out. Uh, personalized emails, I tried different things, screenshots, following people on Twitter, engaging with them, videos in people's Twitter DMs. I tried all different types of things. And I think that's what you have to do as an SDR. You have to make your job fun every single day. You can't do the same thing every single day and put yourself in a bad spot. I believe in the 80%, 20%. So do 80% of things on a daily basis, that's going to see results. 20% of things you do on a daily basis, that's going to enhance your mindset and build your skill set. Those are things you have to do. I, I think it comes down to also from a standpoint as an SDR, a lot of SDRs feel like they don't have a lot of voice, they don't have a lot of say. I think that's where you have to start building your confidence up and believe like, hey, look, I'm the SDR, I own the process. And, as, and at the end of the day, the SDR is the lifeblood of the entire organization. People forget that. If, a, if an SDR team decided not to show up one month, the company is not going to be in good shape because then you have no pipeline. That, that's, that's just focused mostly on outbound, but even inbounds that are coming in, someone's got to answer those. And so if the SDR, BDR, ADR team is not there, you as a BDR leader, you as an SDR need to be confident in your position that you are providing revenue to the company. You are the person that is putting the lights on for the company because with no pipeline, there are no results. There's no revenue. So that's how you need to treat your role. Don't put, put, don't put yourself down. Don't be like, oh, everything sucks. Be like, no, like put yourself in a spotlight. Like I own the process of the revenue for this company. Like our, our team success is almost in tandem for the company's success. That's the mentality you need to come into work every single day. I don't want to hear about this. Oh, it sucks. Da, da, da. You can put yourself out there. I'm, I made a post about this the other day. You can be a leader within your organization as an SDR. I was as an SDR. I reached out to the CMO and the CTO and the CEO. Again, that was a smaller organization, but you can do that. You just got to put yourself out there. But if you're whining and complaining in the corner, nothing's going to happen to you. So you got to be progressive and you got to put yourself in the spotlight. Yeah, earn it. That's all I got to say. Earn it. <laughs> Quit Definitely. I'm, I'm serious. Quit bitching and earn it. Your career is going to be 40 fucking years. You can eat shit for a couple of years and have some fun doing it if it's going to get you to the next point in your career. Yeah. If you're going to leave at 4 o'clock, if you're going to make, if you're going to do the, the minimum effort, if you're going to just sit there and do, you know, you know crank out templates, then you're going to get treated that way. Period. I'm sorry. Like a lot of people get treated that way because they act that way. So let's let's not like sit here and say, oh, SDRs are treated like, look, I get it. SDRs are shit on all the time. I see it on LinkedIn and I think it's unfair in a lot of cases. But in a lot of cases, it's fair because kids because I leave the I leave all the offices and at five o'clock, it's a ghost town. You don't want to get treated like a you know piece of shit and stay until five thirty six o'clock. Do the extra effort. Do more than what you're asked of. And then people will stop treating you like shit. All right. And forget about the, the, you know, what the world is saying about it. Like, who cares about what's saying on LinkedIn about SDRs? What is your job saying? What is your boss saying? That's what matters. Who cares about what's going on on LinkedIn and all that other dumb shit? Exactly. And like to the point of that, you know, for, for salespeople thinking that, uh, you know, only SDRs feel that way. It's really not that different in marketing. Like I started off basically as a junior analyst at an SEO company and I was doing 90 to 100 hour weeks sleeping in the office. I really didn't know what I was doing. The founder of the company was on the road. He was a big thought leader, constantly speaking at conferences. 
I was the second person to be hired at that company. And by the time I left, there was 20 people. Uh, and I moved on to pipe drive to really start, you know, running shit there. So it's not just the SDRs that have to deal with this. It's in marketing too. It's basically in any industry job that you want. When you start at the bottom, you yeah. got to do what you got to do to stand out. And uh, like John said, stay at the office till six o'clock. You know, even, even us three right now uh, on this webinar, guess what's happening? Our work is piling up. Our inboxes are, are piling up. We're going to have to stay later today. Uh, but, you know, we love what we do and we're passionate about it and we give a shit. So uh, that's why we, we get the results that we get. And uh, I don't know. Any, any closing remarks, guys? Yeah, I want to I close on top of this question because now I got more fired up. So <laughs> because at the end of the day, I think people need to understand, like, what are you, like, what are you willing to give up? Like, to get respect, you have to work for that respect. So when I started at Termis, we were getting in at 5, 5.30 in the morning, like ready to go. And we were leaving at 7 o'clock at night. Like it's not, these are not things that just come out of nowhere where it's like, oh, like I'm just going to get respect because I deserve respect. No, you got to earn it. You got to come in every single day. You have to show up earlier than your CEO. Like that was my goal every single day. Like I'm going to look at my CEO in the eye and be like, I'm, I'm here earlier than you. Like that's what I wanted to do. You don't have to be that aggressive, but I think it's depending on what you say you want to accomplish or what you say you want in return from the atmosphere of your internal culture or the atmosphere from LinkedIn or social, you have to show up and do those things. And I feel like a lot of people miss out on that because they see all these cool things and they're like, oh, wait, this is easy. It's like, it's really not like you got to be consistent in showing up every single day because that's how you get yourself in a good spot. So that's yeah. really my, my word to everybody is like, be consistent in showing up and don't talk about the things you're going to like talk about them if you want to, but make sure that you're doing them. That's probably the one thing that probably makes me the most angry is that when someone's like, I'm going to do this and then they don't do anything and then they complain about it. That's the worst thing of all time. Those 80, those 90 days on the uh, training I did last year and 150 days on the road, that was 150 days away. Uh, I was away from my seven year old daughter and wife. So don't give me shit about, you know, sacrifice, all right? I mean, and, and that's, that's not even a fraction of the sacrifice that other people give uh, to be great at what they do. So you want to be great, be great. Work your ass off. You want to be average, stay average. Eat shit. Man, so. I, I, there's no better way to end the webinar than that. <laughs> okay, guys, I got to bounce real quick here because I'm actually 10 minutes late to another webinar that I'm doing for a client. So, Morgan, if you want to tell everybody how to uh, get in touch with us, but, uh, Jatano, thank you so much for this. No doubt, John. Peace. Appreciate it. Bye. Have a good one, man. Sorry we kept you late. Yep. Uh, uh, cool. cool. Morgan, why don't you uh, tell, tell the folks uh, where they can uh, find you guys and how they can connect with you? Yep. So best way to connect with us. So from John's perspective, as you see, it's Twitter, IG, and Snapchat's on there. John M. Barrows. His email address is john at jbarrows.com. And then jbarrows on LinkedIn. And then also the website for us is jbarrows.com. For me, Morgan J. Ingram, that's Instagram and Twitter. Uh, emails Morgan at jbarrows.com and then Morgan J. Ingram on LinkedIn. Uh, those are the best ways to get in touch with us. I know that you said there's a ton of questions that came through. Sorry we couldn't get through all of them. But if you do have a question, please feel free to either email us, Snapchat us, Instagram, Twitter, <laughs> LinkedIn us. We will make sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, this was an awesome webinar. I've really enjoyed being on here today. Definitely, definitely. And if you're an SDR on this webinar, make sure you hit up Morgan and connect because, you know, Morgan has definitely, you know, cut cut his teeth and, and did what he had to do to really grind through what it's like to be in sales development and has really made a great uh, personal brand for himself. And I, I, Morgan, I really appreciate you joining us, man. It's been really great having you and sharing this really uh, invaluable knowledge with the audience, man. I really can't even put a price tag on it. So appreciate you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. And this was awesome. Hopefully we can do something like this again. Uh, hopefully we can get to all the questions. Maybe we'll just have a straight Q&A session. We can get through all those questions. But this was really awesome. Thank you for moderating this. Uh, thanks for putting this together. Yes, sir. Hopefully we'll see you soon. All right. Well, th that concludes our webinar for today, everyone. Uh, like Morgan said, you know, if you couldn't get, uh, we didn't get to your question, hit us up and uh, we'll be in touch next time. So have, have a great day. Have a great week. Keep dialing and make it happen. Keep dialing, <laughs> Keep dialing and make it happen. Peace. <laughs> we out of here.